I think that's fine. That's to your iPhone. You're, you're, you're okay with through iPhone. Just, yes. just keep it there. Just keep it there. Yeah, that's exactly the right place. Leave it here. Yeah, fine. That's that's okay. Good. Yeah, leave it there. In now. now. Just going to admit everyone in. Assalamu alaikum, folks. Uh, apologize for the uh, late, slightly late start, simply because we had some technical issues which have been resolved. Uh, I can see some regulars. Uh, Professor Sayyid, Assalamu from the US. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Uh, Professor Malik. Okay, right. Uh, I did leave you a message, Professor Malik, on your phone. I'm not sure if you can use WhatsApp, but I'll get back to you. Check your voice message. But anyway, uh, very quickly, um, I'm going to allow, if you give me about a minute or two to allow everyone in, uh, and then we can start. Assalamu alaikum, Malana Tikar. Faisal, how are you? He won't be able to hear you because everyone's on mute at the moment. Okay. Khair, inshallah. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers and sisters. Eid Mubarak. I hope you had a great Ramadan and a great Eid. Welcome back. Uh, welcome to our session. Um, it's a book review, Rethinking Reform in Higher Education, from, from Islamization to Integration of Knowledge, uh, with our dear uh, <coughs> distinguished guest, uh, Honorable Professor Ziyad al Sadar from the Center for Post-Normal Policy and Future Studies. And, we're ho and it's hosted by Dr. Shabir Mimia from the University of Huddersfield. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Welcome. Shamim, are you there? Okay. Yes, I am. I am. Can Thank you hear so me? Much. Yeah. We can hear you perfectly. Yeah. Great. Okay. So oh. before I hand over to uh, Dr. Shamim, just a reminder to everyone, it is being recorded. So um, don't need to worry if you are registered, you left your email address, we'll, get, we'll send you a link uh, to the copy of this session. Uh, and with all of our sessions, the format is the same. Uh, we'll have around, Dr. Shamim is going to introduce the speaker and uh, the speaker will have around 30 minutes or so to talk about his book and questions from Dr. Shamim. And then after that, we'll have, uh, we'll have some um, Q&A from, from everyone in the audience. Um, once again, I think this, everyone should be on mute. If you're not on mute, please put your devices on mute. Uh, simply, it makes it easier for everyone, number one. And number two, please leave your email address if you want to, if you want to get a copy of this uh, recording, if, if, you're not, if you're not so registered. So without further ado, I'm not going to waste any time. Uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Shimon. Bismillah. Thank you. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, I know it's a very bright weather outside. We'd rather be doing uh, other alternative things, but really appreciate you, uh, you all tuning in. Uh, I've been really looking forward to doing this interview with uh, Professor Zayedin Sardar for, for some, from some time now. Um, so uh, the time has really, really uh, I've actually come. So, so without further ado, let, let's, let's quickly... Um, uh, just explain the format first, and then we can we, we can get into the uh, the actual interview itself. Uh, the format would be: I mean, I've, I've got a number of questions uh, for Professor Zaid and Sardal, um, and then hopefully at the end there will be opportunity for people to ask us questions. I think it's the usual format: if you just type in your questions under the chat, uh, and then and then we can we can share those questions um, at the end. So hopefully it'll be 30 minutes um, uh, a conversation with uh, uh, Professor Sada and the remaining 30 minutes will be opened up for Q&A. Um, is that okay, Ms. Enbei? Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that I don't need to um, give a long uh, introduction uh, to uh, Professor Zia Sada. I think everybody's more or less familiar with his, with his uh, a writing, if you like. Uh, so um, just, I thought, I thought uh, for those people who are not familiar, I thought a, a really quick uh, a synopsis would actually help. Um, I, Professor Zia Sada is obviously all, uh, the author of over 50 books uh, and he continues other, uh, a, um, a scholarly writing in his journal articles and uh, a diverse areas including religion, politics, culture, science, uh, and most crucially future studies. Uh, he was uh, the editor of the prestigious journal uh, Futures uh, and is currently the director of the Centre for Post-Normal Policy and Futures Future Studies. Uh, 
So today, the, the question uh, and, and more or less the discussion will revolve around uh, this book here. Um, I don't think if people can see it. Uh, yes, 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 so yes. it's uh, Rethinking Reform in Higher Education, which is published by Triple IT. Um, so that's that's basically what um, what, what the format is. Um, I, so uh, if I could just basically just uh, welcome Professor Zia Sada uh, formally and and uh, I start with asking asking the first question if that's if that's okay. Sure. Okay, so uh, your first chapter, I uh, titled Mapping the Terrain, um, is over 80 pages and it locates some of the kind of micro, macro issues dealing with higher education uh, institutions throughout the world in general, but the, the West in particular. So I'd like to start off um, uh, asking you if, uh, if you could just basically just share your thoughts on this idea of crisis that you basically talk about in this chapter. Uh, thank you, Shamim. Uh, yes, I think it's not just me who's raising the question that uh, higher education is in crisis. There's a vast amount of literature on the subject. Uh, I think the first and foremost, most people recognize that universities and other higher education institutions have now become corporations. I mean, they're run like business. Uh, uh, in fact, in many places, neoliberalism has more or less taken over um, uh, universities and as a result universities have become both an instrument of promoting neoliberalism uh, not just as economics but also as political dogma uh, as well as be functioning within the framework of of, uh, of market economy which is of course one of the main pillars of uh, uh, neo neoliberalism so that's i think one of the first things there's a there's almost total takeover of, of universities but there are lots of uh, other associated uh, 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 crisis, if you like, there's a crisis of epistemology in the sense that the, that knowledge production has changed phenomenally. Even when I when the book came out, the book was written around 215, 216 came out or 217. Within the last five years, knowledge production has changed phenomenally. So when I was actually writing that, I wasn't quite aware of how much artificial intelligence or AI will contribute to knowledge productions. Now it's become a kind of major uh, uh, concern for some people, but of course an opportunity for, uh, opportunity for, 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 for others. So, so the very nature of knowledge production is, is, uh, is, uh, is changing. And one of the crises of, of universities is they're producing graduates uh, for a job market that may actually disappear very fast. Right? So they're producing uh, uh, people uh, for, if you like, uh, the assumption is for the present, but the present itself is changing, and the future is changing even more profoundly and even more, even more, even more rapidly. So there is no foresight or futures orientation in what universities are doing in, in you know, in, in most of this stuff. And other aspect of epistemological uh, issues are the disciplines are becoming too entrenched. Problems are becoming complex. Uh, many of them we call wicked problems. That means they don't have instant solutions. They cannot really be solved. They can only be navigated. Uh, uh, while uh, universities are kind of based on these disciplinary silos, uh, not talking to each other, defending their defending their their, their, their territory and, and and what have you. So there's there's the, the neoliberal takeover. There's the epistemological crisis. Uh, there's also the question of what are universities for? Uh, that question has come up again and again. You know, is it for producing, you know, responsible citizens, you know, moral human beings, or simply for uh, simply uh, people who have certain kind of knowledge to do certain kind of things? Um, I think that's that's kind of enough in terms of crisis. And there, there are a lot of other aspects and, and that chapter kind of lists them in, in, in some detail. Mm -hmm. Now, this crisis that you talk about, is this more central to uh, European institutions, uh, kind of advanced? Uh, no, I, no, I think, I I don't, no, 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 I, I will say it's, it's a universal crisis. Uh, uh, um, 
I mean, the issue, the, the issue of education without excellence, which is the name of a very, very famous book on the subject, uh, is, 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 is not limited to the West. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's throughout the world. Uh, the discipline silos still exist. A uh, lot of universities in the Muslim world, for example, are now businesses. Uh, there's also one of the crises, the crisis of uh, uh, the, the financial crisis, especially after port, uh, uh, after uh, COVID-19, many universities will find themselves in a very severe financial strain. Uh, some may, in, I mean, even in Britain, there is a, there is a fear that one or two may actually go bankrupt. Um, the question of higher fees, what do you do with people who can't afford to pay, to pay such fees, not just in, in, in Western countries, but also in the rest of the world. Uh, so, the, so the crisis of edu uh, higher education is not limited to the West. I think it's the kind of a, a planetary global, global crisis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if we can just perhaps just move uh, a slightly um, to talk about more to do with the issues to do with uh, epistemology. Um, so in, in this chapter, you also talk about different types of knowledge as well. You talk about uh, knowledge, knowledge, a uh, production, knowledge, dissemination, etc. cetera. Yeah. Um, so if you could just um, unpick those uh, ideas for us, please. Okay, first of all, I think the, the, the question of disciplines. Uh, where do disciplines come from? I mean, you know, the, the world did not emerge with these disciplinary boundaries. This is sociology, this is anthropology, this is physics, this, this is chemistry. Uh, the disciplinary structures are, if you like, uh, manufactured. Uh, and, and disciplines themselves arise out of a particular need of a culture uh, or a society. So, for example, when the, the, the emergence of anthropology is when uh, 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 it, imperial um, uh, powers felt the need to kind of control and manage non-Western cultures. So the whole field of, of uh, uh, anthropology was developed. Uh, the field of sociology was developed when they want when when the, the, the elite uh, wanted to understand the working classes, right? Uh, and working classes had to be managed, managed and controlled. Right. And the poor law and all that that that, that we have in Britain, it, you know, this is all part of the history of history of history of, 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 of sociology. Uh, political science is probably the most Eurocentric and ideologically biased uh, 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 discipline that you, you can find. In fact, if if you go to an American institution and, and learn kind of you know political science, you probably are learning. Uh, um, American foreign policy and the history of American foreign policy is what, what, what's happened here. If you come to Britain, a, a great deal of this to do with kind of Plato and Aristotle, and then you're, you're again in the, in the colonial administration and, and foreign policy of the empire and then foreign, British foreign policy and, and, and so on and so forth. So the disciplines themselves are ideologically biased, uh, uh, tend to have Eurocentric bias as well, and the, the boundaries of the disciplines are artificially created. That's the first thing. The second thing is that disciplines themselves serve the functions of a particular society. They arise out of the needs of a particular society. Right? It is, it is interesting to note, for example, that anthropology did not arise uh, 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 out of uh, non-West. Ibn Khaldun did not think of anthropology, right? Because he did not have this notion of other cultures that, that needed to be controlled, 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 and, and, and managed. So that's the, that's the first thing, right? That, that disciplines, are. but disciplines do two other things. Uh, they discipline as well in the Foucault sense of, of, of punishment, right? So uh, if you are out of the boundary of, 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 of your discipline, uh, uh, or you do not follow the, the the theories and the structures and the great men, and also it's, in most cases it is the great men, you know, their ideas of thought, then, then you are not, then you can't publish in the area, you know, you are, you are disciplined in, 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 various, in various ways. I remember a, a very famous me meeting in, 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 in Mexico City. Um, as a, as a young science journalist, this is a very long, long time ago, I'm a very old guy now. As a young science journalist, I was there in Mexico City uh, 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 talking about Latin American history of science, right? 
uh, uh, in those days, there was no such thing as Latin American history of science. There is, there is a now a discipline called Latin American history of science. But in those days, in the early 80s, there was no such thing as a, and I was involved in the radical science movement and so on and so forth. Uh, and I had written a few things about Islamic science. Um, so I was there as, you know, as one, of, one, one, of, one of the participants and a great scholar uh, whose, whose name was Derek de Sora Plice, who's a very well-known historian of science. I uh, wrote a book called uh, Science After Babylon, which became very famous, and Big, Little Science, Big Science, which is also a very famous book of his. Uh, he was there, uh, and he gave the, the, the opening lecture, and in the opening lecture he said, there is no such thing as Latin American history of science. There is only history of science. And he produced various uh, bibliometric evidence to suggest uh, that if you wanted to do history of science, you talked about Newton and Galileo and Copernicus and the Copernican Revolution. And if you are radically inclined, you talk about Marxist method and J.D. Bernal and people like that. Uh, and if you really wanted to do a PhD in history of science uh, uh, anywhere in America, that's what you will have to do. Right, so there is no, there is no such thing as history of science. Uh, after which, then I, I was one of the people who attacked him vigorously, and a number of other people attacked him vigorously. Uh, uh, and the young scholars who were there then got very disillusioned. Uh, but later on, uh, I think they, they came together and created a, 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 a field of discipline called Latin American history of science. So, so disciplines also have this kind of hegemonic tendencies that they will, they will not allow other uh, notions to uh, other ways of doing things and other eight subject areas to actually come up within their within within their framework, uh, and they also disciplines also colonize in a sense. Uh, so, if for example you continue to do the sociology the way it has always been done in in Europe, or anthropology the way you already, uh, it has already, always been done uh, 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 in the West. Uh, then you are not doing what your own society may need in terms of sociological uh, inquiry or in terms of um, anthropological inquiry. I mean, one of the most interesting and weird things I experienced, for example, when I went to the University of Malaya and I went to the Department of Anthropology, and I said, why are you teaching anthropology? And anthropology, don't you realize that you are the preferred among the first people that the British anthropologized? Yeah, the whole notion of the myth of lazy native comes from, from here. And it was one of your great scholars, Sayyid Hussain Nasser, who wrote the book called Myth of the Nazi Natives, right, to, 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 to actually debunk that. And you're teaching that kind of, uh, kind of that. Um, now, this, is, does not, this, this does not mean that disciplines themselves are not aware of these shortcomings. Anthropology is a very good example. So we have had a number of different anthropologies, uh, you know, liberal anthropologies, uh, uh, postmodern anthropology, radical anthropology, right? Uh, um, anticipatory anthropology, all to try and hide the basic roots of the discipline, but you can't really do that. And it is, it is interesting to note that the vast majority of anthropologists today work for multinational corporations. They, for example, teach people like McDonald's how to produce burgers that are suitable for the natives, right? or how to exploit the, 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 the indigenous natives in, uh, uh, in Latin America. There have been a number of studies and a lot of um, uh, 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 kind of uh, exposés have been done and how anthropologists have, have, have been used to, uh, to exploit the Native, Native American kind of bloodlines and DNA and, and DNA and, and, and so on and so forth. So the first problem of uh, knowledge production is the disciplinary structure it's, itself. As I was saying earlier on, the, uh, that when I was writing the book, I wasn't quite uh, uh, aware, I did not anticipate how rapidly and radically knowledge production will actually change. So nowadays, more and more knowledge production is based on big data. Right? And big data incorporates all sorts of things. It incorporates things like lies and fake news and, uh, and you know, uh, troll stuff and all, all, all that. Uh, and a lot of it, a lot of it is racially biased. Uh, uh, and knowledge production is also now increasingly being uh, done through artificial intelligence. So AI then produces a great deal of knowledge. So what's happening is that 
what I call emergent knowledge, knowledge that will be emerging in the near future, will have certain characteristics. So it will have what we may call objective knowledge in the Pythagorean sense, right? The core of it. The way to think of it is three kind of spheres with three links. So at the core, you may have objective knowledge. But on top of that, you will have uh, what we will call toxic knowledge, which is uh, all this uh, racially biased AI, uh, you know, um, uh, big data that incorporates all, all sorts of things, but also uh, what we may call, or what, what, what Ibn al-Ghazali uh, called uh, an, uh, kind of blamesworthy knowledge, knowledge about uh, manipulation of DNA, knowledge about changing human nature, knowledge about producing killer robots, uh, uh, knowledge about uh, how to cheat, cheat death. I mean, there's a phenomenal amount of research done on cryotology and things like that. Uh, so dangerous knowledge uh, is part of that framework. And then on top of all that, uh, you have a whole layer of ignorance. And one of that ignorance, uh, uh, we define as the unthought ignorance. That is, the, that is ignorance generated by the fact that your worldview, your basic principles and exams do not allow you to think of certain things, okay, which are outside the framework. So that whatever lies outside the framework of your basic paradigmic structure is the, is, remains as, as ignorance. And that becomes a major part of it. So you have this kind of a, 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 a three-layered knowledge production Right? And it is not easy for us to actually now distinguish between one layer and the other layer. And COVID-19 provides a very good example of, very good example of, of that. There, there are lots of scientific facts, uh, but there are lots of kind of fabrication and, and lies and, and, and snake oil stuff to per, 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 per being, being promoted. Uh, and some of them has led to scientific research, which has been, you know, if you like, it's a wasted resource. Uh, and so the COVID-19 provides us a very good, good example. So this, the, the overall smog of ignorance surrounds the, the core of knowledge and it's not easy to distinguish. Uh, it will, in, my, uh, in my view, it will become even more difficult as time goes on, uh, in a sense. So uh, knowledge will become a, a, a quite a problematic area. Uh, in, 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 in many sense. I have written a paper recently published in Futures called The Smog of Knowledge, which is about data information and, and wisdom. I don't know whether you've seen it. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Shamim, I can't hear you. Hello? Yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, so thank you, yeah. Um, yes, I have, I have read that paper. Um, just before, in fact, I'll ask you the questions about the paper now and then perhaps uh, there's, there's, a, there's, there's another question that actually kind of came to my mind as, as, as you were speaking. So the first question is, is in the, in, in the paper of Smog of, uh, of Ignorance, you talk about the relationship between knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could just uh, perhaps un, um, unpick that slightly as well. So if you could just, just yeah. Yeah, basically conventionally, what, you know, what, what, what is wisdom? We, we basically associate wisdom with the ability, ability to, to both to have knowledge and to have uh, uh, the, the, the kind of capability of making good and sound decisions. Yeah. Um, but in a, in a kind of rapidly changing world with so many dimensions to knowledge and so many in kind of in, uh, uh, so much of so many approaches required with interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary approaches, right? It is not possible for a single individual to have the kind of knowledge that will lead to good decision making, right? Uh, it, it, so it, the consequences on wisdom are, are direct because uh, uh, you, you, you don't just need knowledge, but you also need to appreciate how much ignorance you do not have in that sense, right? So individuals will find it more and more difficult to be wise. The conventional wise man which will more or less cease to exist. However, what the conventional wise man did can now be done by artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence can deal with that level of complex uh, knowledge, knowledge production. It may not be able to distinguish between knowledge and ignorance, 
in, in, in some cases, but it can certainly deal with the interdisciplinary nature of knowledge in that sense. So a lot of the, dis, lot of the solid dis, decision making, uh, making uh, will be done by AI and not by individuals. Uh, I mean, we as kind of human beings will have less and less agency as we, as we go towards the future uh, in terms of making wise decisions. So what happens to wisdom in the, in the, in the classical way that we, that, that we think of wisdom? And I, in, in the paper, I propose the only way to move forward is to have wisdom communities, is to have people who have you know, transdisciplinary knowledge uh, or, 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 or groups or networks that come together and produce interdisciplinary knowledge, interdisciplinary knowledge and can actually deal with the smog of ignorance in a sense. And so the, so it, it may be that groups and networks and communities make wise decisions rather than artificial intelligence. Yeah. And is that, is that what you um, refer to in, within your article as post-normal wisdom? Uh, I, don't use, I, I don't actually use that term, <laughs> uh, uh -huh. but, it, but in, a, in, a, in a sense, what, what I am arguing about now is that I mean, the whole idea of post-normal is, is that conventional notions and conventional ideas and paradigms are just not working. So we need to move towards new ideas and new notions, you know, that, that take account of the rapidly changing world, that take account of crisis in, in, in education, that take account of how knowledge production itself is changing very, very rapidly. Uh, uh, so you could call it a post-normal wisdom, if you like. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I have a question just um, as, as you were talking about knowledge and anthropology and sociology yeah. and, the, and the humanities. I know that you've, one of the key areas that you've been quite uh, um, uh, critical is the whole notion of Islamic economics. Um, and I guess uh, when you were talking about anthropology, it's, it's the certain logic um, of, of uh, colonize and the colonizer logic that uh, uh, is actually kind of internalized in the way in which people do anthropology. And I guess it's the same with the uh, political sciences uh, and, and, and also uh, in sociology. And thus it's not surprising that when it came to the war in Iraq and various other wars, subsequently, uh, those disciplines can be used as a way of weaponizing uh, against, against, against the kind of uh, um, uh, the, uh, the indigenous, indigenous communities. But I mean, Islamic economics has been quite, quite uh, uh, taken up by quite a number of Muslim institutions, but also banks as well. Um, so if you could just, just, uh, just so talk about that. I, well, think we, I, I think we need to stay. Uh, let me answer the Islamic economic question first, and we, I will then we need to stop a little bit, a little bit back. Uh, remember what I was saying about disciplines. The disciplines are also uh, hegemonic structures, right? So the moment you put the adjective Islamic in front of economics, you automatically make it a subcategory of economics, right? Economics still remain the dominant paradigm and Islamic economics has become a subcategory like ethical economics or environmental economics or ecological economics, right? So it, it becomes a subcategory of overall discipline called, called economics. And it cannot escape the structure and, and the principles and the way economics is done. So what has happened with, with, with with Islamic economics is basically it has become uh, uh, new neoliberal economics at the end of the day. Uh, you know, I, one, of the, one of the things I do, I edit a journal called Critical Muslim. And, and uh, two or three years ago, I asked Nijatullah Sadiqi, who is one of the founding fathers of Islamic economics, just to write a piece, uh, uh, basically autobiographical piece, say how he got involved in Islamic economics over the last 50 years. I mean, he's written like 30, 40 books on this, on, on, on Islamic economics, yeah. You know, what does it mean? What is the conclusion to, be, to of all this? And the article ended by saying that we've done all this work, you know, uh, but we've ended up discovering capitalism with the Sharia. Yes. That's the yeah. concluding sentence. And I remember sending him an email saying, this, is your, this, this undermines what, everything you've been done. I mean, you really want this conclusion. Uh, and he said, yes, this is, the, this is my conclusion. I do not want you to, I was going to edit that out. He said, no, no, I do not want you to edit that out. This is my conclusion, in a sense. Um, so, they, they, so that's kind of one of my basic criticism. And, and this criticism that Islamic economics will become like any other you know, economics, 
and will essentially be capitalism by another name. In fact, I wrote uh, almost 30 years ago in my book, Islamic Future, The Shape of Ideas to Come. And there is a chapter on Islamic economics which says precisely this. This probably was the, it was the only real genuine criticism of Islamic economics in those days. Now we need to step back a little bit. We need to say about how, how did this book emerge? How does the form in, 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 in education uh, uh, actually come about? And the reason it came about is that IIIT, the International Institute of Islamic Thought, have had this project of Islamization of knowledge for a very long time. I mean, I think it started way back in the mid 70s. Now, the function of Islamic, uh, Islamization of knowledge was to actually make knowledge production more suitable and more value oriented to Muslim societies. So the goal was very noble. Right? Uh, and for its time, it was pretty advanced because uh, it was based on the notion that uh, uh, disciplines are Eurocentric by nature. Now, this is in the 70s and the 80s when, when we, we, did not, we, we did not think like that. So in that sense, uh, Islamization of knowledge uh, project was pretty advanced in the 70s and the, and the, and the 80s. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I was one of the one of the sole, sole critics, uh, and, and 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 my criticism was essentially based uh, on the idea that that disciplines uh, uh, do not emerge in vacuums. You know, they are a culture product. They are a product of particular worldviews. So you will not be able to to generate, uh, or you will not be able to Islamize the disciplines, but you can generate your own disciplines based on your own needs and your own requirements and your own value systems. Um, that was basically my, my criticism, which, which still stands. So uh, in the kind of, in the, in the last 10 years, uh, uh, IIIT has realized the Islamization of Knowledge uh, Project has run its course, has done some, some good work and some not so good work, and it's time to rethink the whole enterprise. And that's how I, I came to write first uh, the first paper, Mapping the Italian, and then the second chapter of the book from Islamization to, to, to Integration of, uh, of Knowledge. And so the book is based on, on two concerns. One concern is that how do we move the Islamization of Knowledge product, uh, uh, project to a more fruitful area for the future, while acknowledging both the good and bad that it has done, and what do we do about the crisis of higher education, which, in, which is becoming, which is, in, as I said earlier on, it's, it's, it's universal. It's not limited to certain universities or certain places. Yeah, uh, so uh, within, within the actual chapter two, I, I, I find that the methodology is pretty interesting because it's, it, um, would you consider that to be a polylog in, in, in the way in which that you are uh, attempting to deconstruct the whole notion of Islamization of knowledge? Because obviously it's yourself, but there's various other... I, 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 have say, I have to say straight away, I, I do not believe in Islamization of knowledge. No, no, that's true. I know that's true. Move from Islamization to integration of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, in, in a sense. So the, I think the, 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 the Muslim perspective of knowledge has always been integrationist. Yeah. Even say up to 200 years ago, right? We did not have physics and chemistry uh, and uh, uh, biology. We had a thing called natural philosophy, right? So there was a, there's a thing called natural philosophy and within natural philosophy, people did physics or chemistry or biology or, 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 or whatever, right? In a sense, there was a kind of interdisciplinarity uh, about it. Um, some certain level of integration. And I think mm -hmm. classical kind of notion of uh, ilm in, in Muslim societies has always been an integrated approach to, to, to knowledge. It has never been kind of, uh, uh, segregated. That's why in Muslim culture or Muslim civilization, uh, uh, we have had more polymaths than any other culture. Uh, now I discovered that when I was I was writing Exploration of Islamic Science, one of my one of my, one of my text, textbooks, and and of course all all civilizations have produced polymaths. I mean, it goes without saying. Uh, but then I started counting. <laughs> I started counting them. Uh, using George Sarton's history of uh, George Sarton uh, four volume introduction to the history of history of science, and it became obvious very quickly that that the no sheer number of polymers in, in classical Islamic civilizations are vastly greater than than, than any other and than any other civilization. That's 
comes from the fact that knowledge is not regarded as uh, something that exists in different categories, but it's, it's, it, is, it, is, it is kind of an integrated whole. So you take somebody like Al Bruni, who could do physics, you know, measure the specific gravity of uh, certain metals back to three decimal places. Then he could, you know, determine the coordinates of the cities and, you know, write a book on how, to, you know, if you're, how do you find latitude and longitude if you are in a particular place. Then you can write a book about India and actually say, look, here I'm using a totally different methodology because this methodology is not going to work. Uh, 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 the methodology I use to measure specific gravity is not going to work in, in, in studying India. And then within India, when he comes to uh, yoga, he says, hang on just a minute. The only way to learn yoga is to mm -hmm. abandon all you know and to learn its own concepts and methods. Only then can you appreciate and, 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 and write about it. So he had this, uh, this, this, this thing that he had a very integrated notion of knowledge, but also realized that different knowledge uh, in modes of inquiry required different methods. So he, he was not a great believer in method, but he had different methods. And he said, the method is, is you use the method in relation to the inquiry you're pursuing. So the, this kind of notion of integration <coughs> has al always existed to my way of thinking in, in, in Muslim societies. So what the idea is, is to actually make knowledge production a bit more holistic enterprise. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, uh, folk, uh, uh, realize the fact that the problems we now face are complex problems, right? Uh, and complex problems do not have simple solutions. And one of the, one of the key kind of uh, uh, principles of, of engaging with complex problems is that complexity requires complexity to handle it. Right? Mm -hmm. You do need multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary approaches if you are going to, if you, if you are going to, uh, if you are going to do that. But also, the knowledge, uh, as I was saying, uh, one of the points I missed out uh, when I was talking about knowledge production uh, uh, is that the university academic knowledge production is not always geared to the real world problems that we are facing. Yeah. Right? Not, I mean, what, neo, what uh, uh, neoliberalism has done is, is, is that it has undermined almost every three, every planetary uh, uh, limit that we know. There's supposed to be nine planetary limits. I can't remember them offhand, but there are nine planetary limits, four of which we have already transcended, like uh, the carbon emissions and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and this perpetual notion of growth. And one and you know kind of one dimensional uh, progress has undermined the sustainability of, of, of the planet and there's very very little that disciplines assist uh, do about sustainability there's certain you know disciplines that that you know sustainable development and on this and that but on the whole I mean sustainability is something uh, that all disciplines should all uh, uh, and ought to pay attention to, right? And should, and that should be a part of their integrated uh, framework. Uh, and also, most disciplines lack the future dimension. In fact, I mean, one of the most obvious thing is that if you go to a university, you will find departments of history. If you go to University of Bath, you will find my 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 <laughs> great learned friend, Professor Fakhar Malik, teaching history, right? You find departments of history, departments of sociology, but you don't find department of future. Mm. Yet the students will spend all their time in the future. It's not that these disciplines are not important. Of course, they're important. They're very important. But it is equally important to pay attention to the environment that the students will, will, will inherit. Right? And this is a changing environment. It's not a static environment. Even the present is rapidly changing. Right? Um, just think of the present, how the present has changed in the last six months from where we were to uh, drastic. That's, that's one of our post-normal times. Uh, kind of analysis. I mean, you and I have done some of this analysis together and we've shown that this sort of thing can happen. So it's not a surprise to us, right? Mm. Uh, the, 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 not just the pandemic has emerged, but how the pandemic has changed the present in a very profound way. Um, and the future will be even more radically transformed. So we really do need to think uh, how to kind of bring in anticipation, how to uh, bring in future consciousness, consciousness in the discipline frameworks itself, right? And that's one of the one of the key problems that we need to address. And that's what the whole 
uh, Islamization, integration of knowledge is all about. I, I think that's what, and of course, the, the, one of the, uh, the other, other focus is, I think the, the, the focus of the conventional knowledge production is, is the Western man. And we want to move it to humanity in that sense, the more holistic approach to the human being. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point that you made before uh, in terms of when, when it comes to history in various humanities, we have a way of decolonizing the past. Um, but we don't necessarily have the same application of decolonizing the future because the future, as, as, as we know, is, is being colonized as we speak. Um, so I think it's really important to yeah. have sources and methodological approaches um, um, to, I guess, to do that. Um, and obviously you've been very, very, um, I, I mean, most of your uh, time is spent to actually do um, um, in, in doing so, and that's kind of much appreciated. Um, now, within, within the chapter as well, uh, there's, there's just just two other areas that basically uh, I, I talk about. If, if you don't mind, the first is knowledge and virtue, and the other is uh, moving from this whole logic of Muslim civilization to more of a human civilization. If you can just yeah. uh, I talk to that, please, that would be appreciated. Yeah, but I I I I, I think. Um, um, uh, first of all, from Muslim civilization to, civilization to human civilization, there, there, there are two or three basic points to be made. The one is that the conventional notion of Islam being divided into Darul Islam and Darul, you know, that just does not exist in the contemporary world, right? Uh, uh, you can't have th these sort of divisions. Uh, uh, Muslims are now uh, everywhere, right? Um, so we need to we need to see ourselves in in in, in bigger terms, uh, uh, but also you know in, in terms of say modernity of of postmodernism. I mean, uh, uh, modernity is not something that that only exists in the West. I mean, in, to my way of thinking, for example, the Bombay is probably much more uh, modern than Bradford, right, uh, or Atlantic City, right? uh, uh, and even in terms of kind of how postmodernism has, has changed, changed the world. There, you know, uh, the the aspects of so so called Muslim countries which are much more postmodern than than you find. I mean, I've been to Kuala Lumpur. I think that's much more of a postmodern city, you know, mm. than say uh, you don't find that level of postmodern postmodernity clashes of culture, what have you, you know, uh, uh, grand narratives. Fighting each other, seeking domination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then uh, you probably won't find that in, in in most Western cities. So you can't isolate, right? Uh, uh, either in terms of modernity or in post in terms of postmodernism, uh, or in terms of classical division of Muslims. You know, this is you know, the area of, of Islam, and this is not the not the area of, not the area of Islam. That's 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 one. So we need to step back and think of ourselves, not just as Muslim civilization, but as a global civilization, mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is, uh, this is a bit like, a, uh, in, in historic uh, term, is Marshall Hodgkin's idea of rethinking Islam as world history. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Not, 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 not just uh, focusing on Islam as Islamic history, but Islam as, as world history in the sense. So we need to think of ourselves as a global civilization rather than just a kind of a, 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 an enclave, uh, a tributary of, of a greater civilization, right? That, that's the first thing. And if you start thinking about, uh, 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 thinking about, if we start thinking about ourselves in global civilization, then we also have to think of ourselves as, as a human civilization, in a sense. Uh, and there are, there are no, uh, I mean, there, there's nothing that can, put, that can protect Muslims that, that, that happens globally. If there's a fin global financial cli crisis, for example, it will affect the Muslims as much as it will affect everywhere, anybody else. Right? Uh, if the global pandemic, the Muslim countries will suffer as well. Right? So we are part of the human, part of the human family. The climate change is going to affect us all in that sense. Right? Uh, so we need to kind of be much more broad-minded and open-minded and think of ourselves in terms of a human culture, a human civilization, than just simply as Muslims. Right, that's that. But that does not mean that whatever values and the tradition we cherish, we should abandon that. That still remains part of us in that sense. Right? Uh, because for us, 
uh, what is the function of knowledge at the end of the day from a Muslim perspective? I would argue that the function of knowledge is to produce a moral uh, human being with wisdom. Right? I mean, that, I, I would say that's, I mean, if you look, say, if you, if you read uh, Ghazali's book of knowledge or, 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 or Khaldun's uh, Muqazma, the kind of knowledge, you know, mm. scholars are, I mean, Rush, the kind of knowledge that, that, that they're talking about, uh, it is not, due, it's, 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 it's not uh, totally divorced from certain virtues. The knowledge and humility go together. Uh, the more you know, the more you realize how little you know and how much ignorance there is. And in fact, in contemporary times, um, uh, ignorance is going to come back in a big way. And I mean, there's a whole new discipline of ignorance studies uh, and ontology uh, uh, that is that is a, that is emerging right now because ignorance is becoming a very very big issue. It's going to be. I mean, there will be department of ignorances in 10, 15 years in in universities uh, uh, if they, they they transform and change themselves. If they remain the same, of course, they, they won't. Be. So uh, we 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 need to uh, pay attention to the, the virtues side of knowledge, which we have completely ignored. Uh, and by which uh, I, I, I don't just, I mean, these are not just Quranic virtues, humility, you know, um, uh, respect for nature, uh, compassion, generosity. Uh, I would say they are, they are on universal virtues, which, which most culture will accept and adopt. Excellent. I think that gives us a, a really uh, sufficient time for us to move to question and answers. Is that, is that okay, Ms. Anbay? Yep, that's fine. Um, I th we've got a number of questions, but I think we'll start off um, with Professor Said Khan from the US. I'm just going to unmute him, and we have also uh, Professor Ibrahim as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Professor Said. Right. Uh, Assalamu Thank you so much, uh, uh, Zia Saab, a, a wonderful uh, uh, meditation. Uh, so currently I'm, uh, along with being a historian at Wayne State University in Detroit, I'm also the director of uh, Global Studies. And one of the proposals that I've made on campus, um, and for quite honestly, part of it is because of budgetary reasons in order to maintain the relevance of Global Studies, but also because it seems intuitively geared toward this, is to make the department into an incubator by which other disciplines can then flow into and collaborate with global studies uh, in order to rethink, ideally to calibrate uh, the university culture while also seeking to solve uh, pressing issues, uh, as you said, for the future. And particularly at a time when in, in history courses, unfortunately, the emphasis seems to be placed on uh, analogy as opposed to causality when it is a causality that can help uh, and map uh, future trends. So I was wondering if you could uh, uh, give some insight as to whether that is a, um, a viable model uh, that, that uh, you're, you're speaking of. Thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely, I, 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 would, I would argue that a that, uh, move towards global studies is essential. Now, what, basically, what do we mean by global studies? And by global studies, we mean taking the planet as a whole uh, looking at what um, um, uh, Shamim was mentioning as polylog, that is bringing in different cultures, not in a dialogue, but in a polylog together, different perspectives, uh, uh, different outlook, different worldviews. Uh, in other words, what we are doing, we are creating a complex uh, emergent knowledge system to deal with a complex emergent uh, problems, uh, wicked problems as they are called, right? Uh, uh, and that is one, one, one way to move forward, in my opinion. Right? But you will immediately have problems. One is that disciplines don't like to collaborate with other disciplines. They have to maintain discipline boundaries. They have to maintain discipline boundaries for two or three reasons. One, what they will call integrity, the integrity of the discipline. The integrity of the discipline is based on its own history, on its own theories, and on its own great men that you have to quote when you're writing the thesis or writing the papers, etc. Et so that's that. The second will be funding, right? Because all, all of them are, all these different disciplines are, 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 finding, are fighting, fight, fighting for funds. 
uh, uh, but third will be this kind of notion uh, that we were talking about, the connection between knowledge and, and virtue. So when, they, when uh, you have one discipline coming in to engage with another discipline, there's hubris on both sides. You know, there's no humility that over discipline has a limited purview. Right? Uh, every discipline wants to be the dominant discipline in that sense. So there will be. A, so I would not be surprised if you did, if you did not receive you know phenomenal uh, um, kind of a, a backlash and resistance and dismissal of dismissal of the of the idea uh, in a sense. But uh, to my way of thinking. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any other way except moving forward like that. Now, there's one connection here. So when Ibn Khaldun talked about um, um, Umran, you know, his notion of civilization is, is Umran, and the Umran ilm, the ilm that is based on civilization, ilm, that's the kind of thing he was talking about. Right? If he was alive, he'd probably call it you know, global studies. Right or or global civilizational studies or, or something something like that. Now in a sense, uh, he wanted to bring Christian, Jewish, and and Muslim perspectives together. And now we have broadened up. We want to bring in secular perspective, atheist perspective, perspectives of believers, the perspective of the indigenous people. Uh, you know, uh, as well perspectives of the, all these numerous disciplines which have their own specific outlooks. So the, the, the mix, the complexity is much, is, 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 is much greater. So I would say there's also a kind of Islamic connection to, to doing this sort of thing. Great, thank you. Do you see that as being a more viable and uh, uh, perhaps a, an alternate model to say uh, the Zaytuna College model, which seems to again uh, focus, it seems more on, on the terminology uh, and the nomenclature of Islam? Uh, this, this is, <laughs> um, basically, I, I think there is hard, there's no point in teaching terminology and nomenclature of Islamic culture. Right? Our problems are very, 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 very different. I mean, uh, if, you just, if you just teach people, uh, you know, certain, uh, it's not just your teaching, so certain theology, you're sitting, you're teaching a subset of theology of, of the Sufi theology, or even subset of the Sufi, Sufi theology. You are not equipping, equipping people who deal with the complexity of the world. They are not. See what one of the what is the function of education? Right? Uh, to my way of thinking, at this moment in time, one major function of education is to equip students to deal with the changing environment. Right? Rapidly changing environment. How do you adjust to change? Now you cannot adjust to change simply because uh, if, if your knowledge is, is just terminology, nomenclature, certain certain classical texts, right? You need you need to do much more than that in, in a sense. You need to have wide range of wide wide range of knowledge uh, of contemporary time. Now this does not mean that all that is not important. It simply means that you uh, have a very truncated understanding of, of, of contemporary times. You may have a profound understanding of history. Uh, you may have a profound uh, understanding of a particular historic author, but you have a truncated and limited understanding of what is happening in the world at this moment in time and where we will be in the future in the next 10, 15, next 10, 15 20 years. Now, the thing about global studies is I would argue that even though you will get a lot of resistance now, in five, 10 years time, it will be the obvious thing. People have, because people just cannot solve. I mean, we have seen the, 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 the kind of, the severe problems of decision-making that COVID-19 has caused uh, in the British government. Why? Because the problems they are dealing with are very complex. There are so many contradictions. They are, on one side, they're they pulled by neoliberalism and the markets. Another side, they're pulled, they're pulled with kind of concerns for health and welfare of their society. Scientists are all divided. No scientist can give them an exact answer because there isn't an exact answer. Uh, the, the, the pandemic arises with the built-in ignorance part. And the built-in ignorance part is that we do not know how it will react in, in society. It's a new, it's a new virus. So we know very little about it. 
So the, 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 the dimension of knowing it is the future ignorance part. We, can, we will know something about it in six months time, in a year's time, probably in three years time, we'll know a great deal about it and we may be able to manage it. But at this moment, that knowledge is missing. That is the ignorance dimension. And we don't know how to deal with that ignorance. So a contemporary education has to deal, teach people how to deal with ignorance, right? Uh, how to spot ignorance, how to, how to deal with it, how to adjust to rapid change. And I think, uh, I, I, I don't know that enough college, so I shouldn't say anything about it, but I would say, what I could, I would say that traditional kind of uh, uh, knowledge and academic systems do not uh, prepare people. Uh, they did not prepare people for more to, uh, to adjust to modernity. So we saw what happened in the 50s and the 60s and 70s, and they certainly do not uh, prepare people to adjust to the rapid change that is happening in contemporary times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if you've got any questions, can you please um, uh, write it via chat or uh, directly on Zoom? Um, we've got a couple of, I think I'm just going to bring in Wahaj, he had quite a few questions. So Wahaj, I'm going to unmute you. So I'm sorry, it's going to be um, uh, Mehmet Erjan. So I'm just going to bring him in. Um, just bear with me. Unmute. Mehmet, Bismillah. Hello. Okay. He doesn't. Okay, so I'm gonna go to Waha. Uh, I think Mohammed is not now. So I'll go to um, Waha. Just, just bear with me. Okay, Wahaj, go ahead. Thank you, Jazakallah Khair, uh, Professor. Very profound um, and very appreciated for your time. Um, first question I had was pertaining to this, uh, the concept that you talked about in terms of developing groups of wisdom to, to really tackle some of these key questions. Mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, then, um, groups of wisdom still being a subset within a society which is producing education, you know, knowledge uh, based upon a Eurocentric culture. Is that fundamentally possible in any way, shape or form without actually looking at key questions of establishing an alternative society which has a very radical and different premise? Um, and the second question, or do you want to go with that first and then I can go to the second? Yeah, 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 yeah that, 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 uh, let's, deal, let's deal with that uh, first. Um, um, now, I, 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 I do believe that uh, many of the disciplines that, that we have faced today uh, are Eurocentric. Uh, uh, but that does not mean that we can ditch them completely. Uh, some disciplines are absolutely essential and necessary, like medicine, for example, uh, certain sciences. Uh, 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 we need sociologists. We need. Uh, we. I would argue that despite all my criticism of anthropology, we still need anthropologists in our society. Uh, but I would ask them to do anthropology not on Muslims but on the West. So they'll be studying the West as an as an anthropological society rather than studying their own societies. But anyway, that's a different issue. So what we need to do is to create uh, a, a, a new disciplinary structures uh, that both reflect our values uh, and also um, uh, uh, solve the, the problems that we face. Now, many of the problems we face are not unique. The problem of poverty is not unique to Muslim societies. Uh, the, we are going to face vast number of problems related to climate change uh, in the next 20 years. For example, you know, the Maldives, which is a Muslim country, will cease to exist in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, uh, why? Because the rises in sea levels. There's a very famous photograph of the Maldives cabinet holding a cabinet meeting, uh, but they're underwater. They're, under, they're in the sea, right? They, 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 they specifically use that photograph to raise the awareness that, that, that their islands are sinking. Um, so where will the Maldives population go? They, they will become environmental refugees. An environmental refugee is a new category. I mean, we have refugees you know, running away from wars, from political persecution. We've had economic refugees, but we've never had environmental refugees. That's a totally new category of refugees that, 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 will, that will emerge. 
uh, uh, last year uh, the temperature in, in Karachi was 49 degrees. This year I think it's already 45 or something like that, 43 or 45 at this moment in time. Uh, once it reaches 50, 52, that's inhuman rise in temperature. What will happen to these cities in a sense? Uh, so we have lots of problems which are not uh, just if you like Muslim problems, they are human problems in a sense. And therefore we need, we need integrated knowledge system uh, uh, that can tackle complexity uh, at the level we find ourselves. And that, and, and uh, they can also do uh, something about the problems we face and uh, fulfill the needs of our societies. So some of these disciplines will, be, they will have to be new, for example, there is uh, there are lots of uh, departments in various universities, including Muslim universities, that teach refugee studies. But what do they teach? They teach migration, right? Uh, they teach, they have statistics, they, they, they research statistics of, uh, uh, of, of refugees. But refugee studies should actually incorporate how do we, how do we accommodate the refugees suddenly and provide them with the very quick uh, um, a suitable and hygienic uh, um, um, accommodation, housing, and what have you. Uh, now, some of some technology already exists to do that, and some can can be innovated, in my opinion, relatively easily. Right? Uh, how how are we going to cope with the with the rising tide of refugees in the next twenty years? And three out of four of these refugees will be Muslim. Right? Uh, so, universities ought to have. A, a kind of a, a refugee studies which is interdisciplinary which not just looks at the migration patterns but also looks at how do you fulfill the needs and requirements of refugees how do you co cope with sudden influx of, 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 of refugees how do you negotiate politically to find find geographic space for them you know all these things need to be learned right and and there's a new discipline waiting waiting to be emerged and um, what do we do with the shortages of water there are many uh, cities in the Muslim world, they will run out of water. Cape Town, for example, ran out of water a couple of years ago. Uh, Istanbul will probably run out of water within the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, uh, there's some other uh, places which will run out of water. So we need a whole new uh, approach to, to water management. The conventional approach to water management, management has clearly not worked. Uh, um, uh, so we need a whole new discipline around, around water, water management. So we need to create lots of new disciplines and we need to be aware of the uh, Eurocentric na nature of existing discipline, uh, disciplines. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, knowledge production has to be, in my opinion, geared towards the needs and requirements of our societies. So we need those disciplines that at this moment in time serve our needs and requirements. And if they don't exist, we have, we have, we have to create it. Uh, now, what I said earlier on about, about wisdom communities, okay, say, uh, the argument there is a much broader and a general argument that in a global world, uh, more and more complex decision making process will, will, will be taken by the artificial intelligence. Yeah? Uh, that will drive, drive us uh, human beings of both of certain kind of agency, but also the ability to be wise and, and therefore we ought to create wisdom communities. Um, uh, it, it does not stop us uh, uh, from going ahead and actually setting up networks and uh, uh, whatever you like to call them, communities, networks of people uh, who we deliberately kind of create with the view, view to saying, when we face complex decision-making process, you will have to provide us guidance. And these communities can be selected, they could be academics, um, coming from different disciplines, they could be experts in brown, you know, uh, it could be, if you like, a very large peer community uh, that, that, can, that, can help and help, that can help and guide us. Uh, the two processes can, can go simultaneously in parallel. I don't see why one process has to be dependent on the other. Next question, Mahaj. Mahaj, yeah, the next um, question. Yeah, uh, the second one was related to, you talked about the, uh, the function of knowledge uh, in terms of producing moral beings um, and the, the direct interlink and interconnectivity with moral beings as well as wisdom. Mm. Um, don't know, how, how does that, f f I'll just read out the question. Um, so uh, 
Is it not to produce a society which produces knowledge which then leads to individuals like moral beings and carry wisdom? Um, and if a contrary society is emphasizing immorality according to an Islamic worldview, um, fundamentally, even when the, the anchoring discussion obviously is divided very differently from Islamic theolo theological perspective, uh, the whole discussion of Hassan and Qab and Khayyad and Shur and how it was divided among theologians. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if a contrary society is emphasizing immorality and you're fundamentally looking to anchor, um, produce moral beings, yeah. Um, how, how can that trend necessarily be reversed uh, without, obviously, the relation to power? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I'm not quite sure I understand the, 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 the question. Um, for me, you see, when we are talking about a crisis in education, one of the, the crises of education, in, to my way of, mind and way of thinking, is that education is not available to the masses. Right? I think every education, is, is the right of every human being. Right? And as a Muslim, I would argue even strongly that as Muslims, we have, every Muslim has the right to be educated. And it can, he and she has the right to be educated to a level where he or she can negotiate the complexity of contemporary times and, and find ways of adjusting to change. This would be my kind of current definition, contemporary definition of what I think the function of education is. Right? Uh, uh, now, part of that education would be uh, uh, actually to teach uh, uh, classical Muslim virtues uh, um, of uh, humility, of generosity, of co compassion, uh, you know, patience, uh, uh, what have you. So if you have universal mass education uh, and people are educated to the level that they can negotiate uh, contemporary complex problems uh, 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 and the virtues are part of the education system that they learn, then, then I would say that, that, that the, 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 if you like, the moral component of the society will be much higher than, than it is at the moment. Yeah. You see, just, I mean, you could have somebody who has perfect Iman, right? Uh, who is uh, 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 praised five times a day, very focused on the kind of rituals, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, but who has no compassion? Uh, who has no humility? In fact, in my experience, I'm, this is a personal experience and a very biased view. I find most pious people not to be very humble, and, and that really worries me. You know, no end. I mean, uh, uh, so if somebody comes and displays piety in front of me, I, I, I get very upset and angry. As I'm not interested in your piety at all. Piety is something that is personal and it should be kept inside you and not displayed, displayed openly. Uh, if you say 50, uh, inshallah, mashallah, and all the du'as in front of me 15, 20 times, I would not even engage with you. Because I know your mind is so occupied with, these, with this kind of stuff that it is, it's, it's, it's not wide enough to bring in a lot of other complexities that, 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 that we have, that we have in, in, in the world. Um, so it's because you're too much of a skeptic now. Yeah, no, 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 it's not that I'm too much of a skeptic. I, I have actually seen this again and again. I tell you what, what really started this. When I was very young, like uh, when I say young, 26, 27, it was my first time in the, in the Haram, in Makkah. You know, I worked at the Haji Sir Center. It was, so I, uh, uh, and, and I, I went, I went to the, to the Haram and I, 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 for those of you who've been on Hajj, probably know that, but you cannot describe the feeling that you have when you enter and uh, when you first time encounter the Kaaba and the, and the Haram. Uh, and one very strong component of that feeling is the total insignificance of your own self, right? Uh, and and in, in the kind of vast cosmos. And when I was coming out, another man who was also coming out with me. And we both came out and there was a black African woman sitting begging and he, his treatment and abuse of that woman was so obnoxious that I could not contain myself, right? Uh, I said, how can this man go in, in Haram, experience that and come, come out and behave like that? And that was the first time I realized just having all this theological baggage with you does not necessarily make you a good person. The only, yeah, and, and the demonstration of whether you are good or bad, however you, I know these categories can be redefined and, and they are dynamic, uh, it basically depends how you treat others. It's in your treatment of others, 
including your own family, starting with your wife or husband and children, to the neighbors and to the community, to other, how you treat others. That's where uh, 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 you demonstrate whether, whether you, you are, a, you are a, a moral human being or not. Uh, not by you know, perpetual rituals. Perpetual rituals are good, those who do it, fine. Right. But to my mind, that is not a demonstration of, of, of your moral caliber. Thank you. We've got you. a comment from um, Aisha. Just hold on. Let me just gonna unmute Aisha. All right, Aisha, let's have your comment. Okay. Aisha, would you like to? Is Aisha, can we see her? No. Uh, we won't be able to see her. I'm just gonna unmute okay. her. Okay, yeah, Aisha, would you like to, um, she's, she's dialing in from Pakistan, would you like to comment? Hello, uh, okay, so it's, okay. All right, uh, there is another question. Um, it's, uh, let me just go hand it over to Dr. Shamim. Yes, Dr. Shamim, I'm handing over to you, guy. Okay. Um... So, do we have any further questions? Because I know got, we've, been we've got quite a few questions coming in through chat. Uh, and so, yeah. uh, I can't seem to okay. see any of these uh, questions, though, um, Zanbay. Okay, so there's one question saying, in retrospect, how do you view Professor Saeed Naqib al Atas's writing, including the latest one, in the context of the future of Muslims? Uh, <laughs> that must be somebody from Malaysia. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Shafiq from Malaysia, yeah. Yeah, uh, I have I have a, I have great respect for for Najib Al Tas, uh, uh, but I do believe that that his worldview is very limited. His his outlook is rather rather uh, rather narrow. Um, um, uh, I think the problem is the the the, the basic uh, definition of knowledge or what is perceived as knowledge, right? Uh, uh, his perception of knowledge as arrival of meaning in the heart is a, is a very, in my opinion, is not a very practical notion of what knowledge should be. But a great deal of knowledge has to be kind of a socially objective. Uh, if knowledge is only something that arrives in, mean, in, the, in the heart, then it's limited to you, right? Uh, that Asotonic knowledge may be good for you or, or not, that's a different issue. But if you're talking about societies, cultures, and civilization, then uh, uh, I think we need a more socially objective notion of knowledge. And the problem there is, 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 is his definition of knowledge, I think, uh, which is too mystical for my, for my, for my taste. But I have, I have nothing against those who want to uh, kind of limit their perceptions uh, to that. But, particular view. But I didn't even know that he's written a new book. So I have not seen his new book, so I can't comment on that. Sure. I've got a question from Alex. Why is future studies lacking in the UK universities? That is a very good question. <laughs> you, know, you know, there is even a, there is even a, 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 a UK government foresight department. And for, 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 for like a couple of days, I did some work for them five, uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and it's very primitive. I mean, you know, the, 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 the uh, future studies has developed phenomenally. And what I saw then was very, 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 very kind of truncated and very limited perception uh, of what future studies is about. I mean, basically just based on scenarios and, 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 and little, trend, little trend analysis. Hopefully it has, it has changed now. But it's a very interesting question. I think I think we will find that future studies will probably take root in places where disciplinary boundaries are not too entrenched. Uh, um, uh, where uh, 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 people realize that you need to teach the future as much as you need to teach other, other disciplines. And it's equally important uh, for students, for example, to learn physics, chemistry, or sociology, or, or, or political science, and also learn and also the future, future's literate. So you, you, you'll get, you'll get uh, uh, future uh, departments in universities uh, that are a bit more open and, in, and, and entertain interdisciplinary work and transdisciplinary work. With the problem with future studies itself, a, a, problem, a discipline problem. 
For example, future studies doesn't have facts, right, in inverted commas, right? Uh, so like history, you can teach historical facts or you can teach physical facts, it doesn't have that. Uh, future studies doesn't, don't, doesn't have many theories, theories, so you can't have a full, you know, theorization stuff as you will have in sociology or anthropology and so forth. Uh, the future doesn't exist, uh, uh, you know, uh, when future is realized, it's already today. I mean, by the time, uh, you know, tomorrow is to today, tomorrow, but when tomorrow comes, it's already today in this sense. So there are lots of discipline problem within, within future studies. So future studies is not going to be established in universities that are structured on, on, on disciplinary boundaries. It has to be uh, 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 placed in, 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 in institution of higher education where there's space for transdisciplinary work. There's a place for interdisciplinary work because you can do future. You can do futures about geography. You can do future of sociology, mm -hmm. right? You can do future of climate change. You know, you can do future of um, um, tribal societies. Uh, you know, you can do uh, futures of polymers. Uh, you, you so you can do futures of of, of 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 anything you want to do. So you you do need an interdisciplinary, multi multidisciplinary perspectives. Uh, and that uh, uh, will only happen when universities begin to change. And I, I, I suspect they will be forced to change, uh, partly because even if they continue to be businesses uh, with the main function of producing people who can be employed, because the nature of employment is changing, because the job structure is changing, uh, we'll find that universities themselves will, 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 will change and the disciplinary boundaries will begin to come, come down. And hopefully then we'll get lots of departments of future studies. Question from Mehmet Özcan from Turkey. Uh, what Dr. Sadar basically is arguing is a new version of West-dominated liberal knowledge by calling it human. Is it a defeat for all non-Western cultures and civilizations? And the final part of that, along with this, how does he see the legacy of triple IT in retrospect? Thank you. That's from Mehmet Ajah. Hey, what, defeat of, I, I, again, I don't understand. Defeat of all Western civilization. Uh, I think, first of all, we need to get away from this uh, antagonistic uh, uh, language and, and perception. Uh, it's not about defeat of anybody. It's about survival of uh, as human beings. As I said, uh, climate change is going to affect us all and uh, in very major ways. So we all have to come together to survive, full stop. Uh, COVID-19 is a good example. Uh, uh, it can only be defeated, right, if all the countries uh, participate and work together to defeat it. Uh, even if it exists in small patches somewhere in a remote part of the world, it can always come back in that sense. Right? So it's not a question of defeating or, 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 or not defeating. Uh, uh, what was it? The, the other part of the, yeah, what a legacy of Islam. I, I, I think I... I triple I, IT. I, triple, like yeah, I said, triple, triple IT. IT I retrospect, yeah. Uh, well, I think Triple ID have, have uh, to some extent, they have a profound legacy. I mean, they've, they've created universities. They have kind of supported, you know, many, many organizations. Chicken farms uh, as well. Sorry, chicken farms as well. Yes, that's where the money comes from. That's, that's where the money comes from, right? Uh, um, I mean, many, many, many Muslims in, in the United States have halal chickens thanks to Triple IT, uh, right? Uh, it, but I, but, but uh, they, uh, uh, as I said, um, the 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 main project was Islamization of knowledge, and I think it was probably the right project for the 70s, 80s, and even early 90s. Uh, but as the structure of knowledge began to change profoundly, it had to be updated and rethought. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's to their credit that they have, they, they have, they have, they have rethought. It's interesting to note that I uh, was one of their key critics, right? Uh, but they all, all, although they did not agree with my view, they always treated me with respect and dignity, uh, in a sense. And, and that's what I, I value about about about, about uh, triple IT. You see, for a long, I mean, I was professor of criticism. I teach criticism, and one of the things that 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 I emphasize the function of criticism is not necessarily to destroy or denigrate the object of criticism. It is, in fact, to enhance the beauty and the quality of the object and the subject of criticism. In, in Okay, well, uh, finally, finally, and, and it is it is it is the kind of criticism we need uh, 
and not the kind of uh, the, the approach that the questioner is, is, is seeking. I'm not uh, liberalizing this or, 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 or destroying Western civilization uh, or doing anything or anything, anything like that. What I am saying is that the need of the present time is that we move towards a more holistic and integrated notion of knowledge Right, that requires an interdisciplinary approach. Okay, so we've got a final question, question chat uh, from Alex. Can or will Muslims accept the notion of future studies? Any signs of this? Uh, well, uh, I think the, 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 the answer is that to uh, accept or reject the notion of future studies, you have to look at Muslim sources, right? So you have to look at what the Quran says. You have to look at what the Prophet said. Uh, you you have to look at uh, what early Islamic history is all about, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and so, I'm not going to tell you, uh, uh, in fact, what the Quran says or, or what the Islamic history is all about. I've written about it. There's some stuff out there if you want. Uh, some of it is can be found on our own website, Post Normal Times uh, uh, website. But I will leave you with two hadiths, uh, which, in my opinion, are profoundly uh, future-oriented. Um, one is the, the famous hadith of the Prophet, uh, you know, trust in Allah, but tie your camel. The tie your camel bit is, is uh, the, the, the camel is not going to wander, out, uh, wander off instantly. It's going to wander off in the near future. When you go and do something else, come back, it has wandered off, right? You tie your camel, and that's a very future-oriented uh, advice, right? That you have to have anticipation of what is around the corner, right? What, what is over the horizon? Uh, how will the world change in five years' time, 10 years' time, right? Uh, you, 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 you may think you're in a very good job today, a very secure job, but the nature of that job, if the nature of that is totally transformed within two, three years, you are going to be jobless in, in, in five years' time. What do you do about that? So I think that's the first thing. And the second of this, which is also very beautiful of this, is that uh, uh, if you think that the world is, uh, 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 I'm paraphrasing, uh, uh, if you think the world is going to end tomorrow and you have a seed, planted. I think it has this, this has two components. If you think the world is going to end tomorrow, mm -hmm. uh, which suggests, uh, and if you, if, you, if you take that part of the this with the second part, if you have a seed, you should plant it. Uh, uh, it suggests that perhaps your notion that the world is going to change tomorrow is not all that valid. Mm -hmm. And second, you should plant the seed because the seed is the future. Mm -hmm. Even if you think the world is going to end. Uh, but I can give you lots of ideas like that. I can cite the various verses of the Quran. Uh, but I, the, the last thing I will say is this, that we are, uh, as Muslims, um, um, and we are uh, encouraged to think about the hereafter. Yeah. The hereafter is the future. But the hereafter is the future, not just after you, you die. It is, also the future, it is also the future of your children. It is also the future of what you leave behind. If you leave a destructive society behind, right, that destructive society will have an impact on your here, hereafter as well. Hereafter is not just something that is out there, but hereafter begins now and continues to infinity. And then you need to do good during all that period, in that sense. If you're... If your progeny turn out to be evil, it has a profound impact on you as well. Uh, so you have a duty to ensure that your children grow up as moral human beings. Thank you, Professor. Before I hand it over to Dr. Shim, just one last question from um, uh, Dr. Omar Anas, uh, who's a professor in Istanbul. Right. Go ahead, Dr. Anas. Yep. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Omer Anas. I, I am basically from India, but I teach here in Ankara. Uh, my question is uh, uh, maybe rather a bit provocative, but I would like to ask, uh, how far do you see the possibility of Islam to survive uh, in, in the future? Because uh, 
the dominance and the sustainability of industrial society and industrial civilization uh, is uh, looking to be uh, staying for a longer time. And the Islamic civilization is not only in decline, but also in failure to offer the solutions uh, and of the problems which are coming out from the industrial society and industrial civilization. So uh, how do you see the possibility of Islam to remain beyond as an idea of identity? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that this this is a very this is a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting question, and I think it's a question that uh, we should all reflect on. I mean, uh, I, I do not think this is a provocative question. I think it's a standard question that we should all, all ask over all ask over, over ourselves. I mean, this notion that Muslims are somehow special, right, and and they can write everything and, and nothing is going to happen to us has to be debunked. There is nothing special about us. Right. Uh, apart from the fact that we are Muslim and the fact that we are Muslim is only special to us. It, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make other people think that we are, we are special. And when you are faced with, 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 with multiple problems as a human community, you are going to fail or succeed like other human communities. In this sense, right. And if you I mean, for example, we, I keep going back to climate change because climate change does uh, represent major threats. Uh, uh, to Muslim society in the future. If you if you do not do anything about that, uh, uh, the coming problems of climate change, uh, you don't start thinking about them now, then the question whether whether the Muslims will survive or not becomes very real, because the, the first profound impact of climate change will be on the global middle belt. And if you cast your mind, this is how the Muslim world used to define itself, that we are the global middle belt from Morocco to Indonesia, right? And this is where the temperatures will rise, right? Uh, think, of, think of what will happen to Bangladesh if, if seawater rises, you know, by a few more uh, centimeters. Uh, it's just- They all live in Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar. They've got enough space, right? Uh, no, no, but that's one longer, but not going to be long. One, 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 one last as well, very long. Somebody has to clean their toilets, right? right? Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> the, 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 the point that the point I, I'm, I'm making is that we do really need to think of the problems we face, and the problems of the industrial cultures have now become our problems because we have been integrated and become part of the part mm. of the industrial culture. We are not, we don't stand aside them. There's a globalized world, right? We don't stand aside. So all the problems of the globe have impact on us. So the global problems are also our problems in, in a sense. Uh, uh, but I mean, the theoretical answer, the answer is that, the, 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 that Islam will survive uh, till the end of time. Uh, but I'm not sure about the Muslims. Thank you so much, Professor. I'll hand it over to Dr. Shamim to close and final comments. Okay, thank you very much for all those uh, questions. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Zid and Sadar for his time and his input. Um, I think um, tomorrow's session is, is it uh, Professor Ibrahim Musa talking yes, about? Yes, tomorrow, yeah. Talk on uh, uh, Al Ghazali. Al Ghazali, or what is education? Sorry? What is the, uh, what, I'm sorry, book on Madrasa or is it? No, well, it's, no I it's, think it's, it's his book on uh, the, uh, uh, Ghazali. Ghazali and the poetics, uh, Ghazali. Po poetics of yeah, the yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, and I think um, Mizambai just sent a uh, message through chat as well. If you're not registered, please leave your email and he can send you the um, YouTube clip once, it, once it's done. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much once again. Assalamu alaikum. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you everyone and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Assalamu alaikum. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.